Hello. Yeah. Uh, so welcome to the afternoon session uh, on, on, on transports. And so in this session, we have three talks, two talks before the break. And our first speaker is Nigel Hasse from uh, the High Magnetic Field Lab at Nijmegen. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to start by thanking Dimitri, Andre, and Andrew for, first of all, for inviting me here to Trest again. It's always one of my favorite places to visit, but also for arranging such a great conference in very much in the spirit of these workshops, and I'm sure we're peers here. You'll be very pleased with the way it's been going. Um, and also, uh, having just had the pleasure of co-chairing a conference with peers um, a few weeks ago, I would like to extend my own birthday greetings to him. So um, we've heard a lot about this system, iron selenium, uh, dealt with sulfur. Um, and the results I'm going to show today are, are new results where we've really asked the question, OK, there's clearly pneumatic fluctuations in the system. It appears that they go quantum critical uh, at, a, at a certain fi fixed doping. And the question t for us was whether this uh, would manifest itself in the evolution of the transport properties at low temperatures as, across the sulfur doping range. So what we did was that we, we killed the superconductivity in a high magnetic field and studied the form of the resistivity uh, with both temperature and sulfur doping. Um, so really, uh, this work is very much the work of my student, Salvatore Licchiadello. Uh, and um, he's been ably supported by members of my group, Jake, Jonathan, and Jian Ming. And the samples uh, that we received uh, very gratefully through our collaboration with Yuji, Taka, and, and Shigeru. OK, so uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction for, for those perhaps less familiar uh, about what we might expect uh, in a material, a metallic system that we can tune through a quantum critical point. Uh, then just show briefly how that criticality, in this case, antiferromagnetic quantum criticality, manifests itself in the transport properties of one of the iron panictide systems. And then I'll introduce the iron selenium and how the resistivity has evolved there. And in time permitting, I will sort of have a preface to, to Cyril's talk about how this is different from the behavior we see in the cuprates. Uh, so um, so we, we're all familiar with this type of uh, picture. Um, and the original theories with quantum criticality, of course, were, were involving insulators and talking about uh, tuning some parameter uh, where it allows you to, to go between different ordered states. And at the intersection between those ordered states, you, you, you saw uh, quantum critical behavior. Uh, but in a, a metallic system, you often uh, tune from some ordered state uh, through the quantum critical point. That often is protected by some other uh, the emergence of some other state, like superconductivity, then ultimately uh, into the Fermi liquid in the, in the disordered regime. But uh, at the, the two extremes uh, away from the quantum critical point is you, normally you can describe the system in terms of product states. So you think of the kind of m magnetic product state here, and then perhaps you know, your slater determinants on this side. But then as you approach this point, you can no longer describe the system as some mixture of these, or you can't describe the system as a mixture of these states. And what you end up with is a quantum entangled state that still defies a, a coherent uh, theoretical uh, description. But we often think of uh, some associating the uh, approach to this quantum critical point as the divergence of some length scale associated with the entanglement. And so for, you know, for anything below, uh, length scales below that, this, this psi, you are essentially, uh, the physics is, is dominated by the, the quantum critical fluctuations. And then, of course, you have uh, an additional thermal uh, length scale, uh, which gives rise, the combination of these two, this diverging, and the other one gives you rise to this quantum critical fan. And perhaps then, if you're measuring transport in, in this metallic system, 
Where you have fluctuations associated with this ordered state, you may end up with some anomalous power law in the low temperature resistivity, you know, like four thirds or five thirds. And then as, as the system becomes ordered and those uh, fluctuations gapped out, you then recover your um, Fermi liquid behavior. And on the other side, of course, we, we expect the canonical Fermi liquid T squared resistivity. But above that, in, the, in this quantum critical fan, you may then get an other anomalous non-Fermi liquid power laws. Perhaps they are different exponents on, on either side. But at, right at the quantum critical point, you, you should see that uh, anomalous uh, exponent uh, tracking all the way down to, to the lowest temperature. Okay, so, so two aspects you see. So as, as you approach on the low temperature side, you see essentially the quasi-particles become increasingly dressed with the, this interaction, uh, the quantum fluctuations, and that gives rise to a divergent M star. And right at this long trajectory A, you, you expect uh, distinctly non-fermi liquid behavior. Uh, this has been beautifully uh, demonstrated, of course, in heavy fermion systems. Kind of the poster child here is the terbium rhodium 2 silicon 2 where the tuning parameter in this case is magnetic field. And you see the two domes of uh, T squared resistivity and the quantum critical fan, where in this case the resistivity is purely T linear over uh, you know, significant decades in temperature. And then the coefficient of this T squared term appears to diverge. So here I should say this is the antiferromagnetically ordered state. This is the disordered state. So this is just purely metallic state. But on either side of the critical field, you see uh, this A coefficient diverging. And this gives you some indication of the dressing of the quasi-particles in terms of their mass. Okay. So the Bering 122 system really gave us the first uh, clean system for high temperature superconductors to demonstrate uh, genuine quantum critical behavior, which is reviewed very nicely in Taka and Yuji's and Tony Carrington's review article back in 2014. So here I show, this plot has been shown before, but this is the derivative of the uh, resistivity at high temperatures above the superconducting state. And you see again the fan of, the, in this case, again, linear resistivity uh, flanked by the, the T squared on both sides. And what was shown in, I think, 2010 was quantum oscillation studies found that as you approach the critical point where, the, in this case, the spin density wave order transition collapses to zero, uh, it's around 30% doping, so here I've got the scale. Uh, you saw a divergence of, of the effective mass determined from quantum oscillation studies. But then, very dramatically, what was measured inside the superconducting state in zero field uh, was the penetration depth, the square of which gives you an indication of essentially one over the superfluid density times the mass. And because this is an isovalent substitution, one didn't expect really the superfluid density itself to be varying. So this uh, very striking uh, peaking of the, of the penetration depth squared uh, really suggested that it was indeed that the mass uh, was being heavily renormalized on approach to this quantum critical point. The fact that it's exactly at the point where superconductivity is maximized suggests really that quantum fluctuations are, are indeed, in this case, ha enhancing the superconductivity. Okay, and what, so what we were interested in, again, uh, being in the high field kind of uh, work, line of work, was to, to see if this, how did this evolve if we kill, the, remove the superconductivity with a high magnetic field and just follow the resistivity down uh, to the lowest temperatures we could. And this work was done uh, in collaboration with James Analytis. Uh, we found, indeed, taking the derivative of the resistivity in high fields, that you basically got a linear line going to the origins uh, for all the doping. So here, uh, we're doping from 70% to 31%. And just to orientate you, so that's really right out here, approaching very close to the quantum critical point. And uh, you see then that this is symptomatic of, of a low temperature T squared resistivity. And its slope, which is proportional to this A coefficient, was getting progressively steeper and in fact went up by an order of magnitude as on approach to this, uh, to this uh, putative quantum critical point. And indeed, the evolution showed very well, good, very good scaling with the effective mass squared as expected, say, from the Kadiwaki Woods, the famous Kadiwaki Woods uh, ratio. So here we saw uh, very much uh, the, the expected in, uh, behavior. 
And what's nice about this system, and quite surprising, is that the, the, all of the effective masses that you determine, whether it's low temperature, high magnetic field for quantum oscillations, low temperature, zero field for the penetration depth, or relatively high temperature, zero field for the jump in the specific heat at TC, they all gave very consistent ideas uh, suggesting that this was really, uh, that the effective mass uh, uh, fluctuations due to fluctuations was the same uh, across the phase diagram. So what about iron selenium? So we, I say we've heard a lot about this system. I don't need to really go into too much detail. Just to say, you know, we have, uh, of course, um, this uh, tetragonal to orthorhombic structural transition um, at around 90 Kelvin in the, in the pure iron selenium system. Um, and that, uh, with some very detailed R pairs and quantum oscillation measurements, uh, you, you find, first of all, if you just take a simple DFT calculation for the Fermi surface, where you expect these three uh, hole pockets, two electron pockets, you lose some of those pockets, show, suggesting those strong uh, electron correlation effects. Uh, this is, uh, like, say, the high T. Uh, this is, sorry, the, below uh, the structural transition, or above the structural transition, then below it, you get a distortion. So you get this actually elliptical shaped. Uh, Fermi surface indicating uh, your electronic pneumatic state. And um, the, the evidence for, say, criticality was coming from the observation of these elasto resistivity measurements from, from Taka and Yuji's groups, showing uh, that the, the, the pneumatic susceptibility is most in, uh, intense, uh, close to the, uh, to the point where the structural transition uh, disappears, and the effective Curie temperature goes through zero for, for this uh, pneumatic susceptibility. And, uh, you know, while there, you know, there are suggestions or experimental evidence for magnetic fluctuations inside this regime, there was certainly no evidence above uh, TS for, for strong uh, magnetic interactions. Um, and so the, the idea is generally that this material uh, you can, you can study the effects of nematicity in, in, in the absence of magnetic criticality. Um, and what intrigue does before we started this experiment was that the actual form of the resistivity is characterized above TC by uh, uh, predominantly T linear resistivity over a wide range of doping. So not necessarily a crossover to T squared in the overdope regime like you saw in the panictides, but more similar in, in essence to what was seen, say, in the cuprates above TC. And so we were intrigued to think, well, what is this? Another indication of, a, of, of the cuprate-like strange metal, or uh, does this show uh, more uh, conventional quantum critical behavior? And so what we wanted to do then is to study possible manifestations of this electronic pneumatic uh, on the transport at low temperatures by, uh, by killing uh, the superconductivity with, with a high magnetic field. Okay, now, one of the nice things about Iron's selenium system is that it's not as anisotropic as the cuprates or panictides. So, and you've got relatively low TC. So normally what we have to do uh, to suppress the superconductivity is apply the magnetic field perpendicular to the conduction planes where HC2 is smallest. That induces uh, transverse magnetoresistance, which somehow you have to subtract off to get the intrinsic electrical resistivity. But in this material, the anisotropy in HC2 is only a factor of two, um, and that allows us to then suppress superconductivity with an in-plane magnetic field where effects of magnetoresistance are, are strongly uh, minimized. So here I can just show you a, a whole set of sweeps up to 35 Tesla for a, a doped sample to illustrate this point that the magnetoresistance, right, there is some small uh, positive magnetoresistance when the field is in the plane, but it shows essentially no temperature dependence, and in fact, really you can see how, how flat it is, yet we're still suppressing superconductivity uh, down to about 1.5 Kelvin in this case. And so then you could actually, in these uh, resistive magnets that we have at High Field Lab, you can then just turn on a 35 Tesla magnet and just cool down um, and follow the, the evolution of the transport across the entire temperature range of interest. 
Okay, so that's what we did. We had a series of eight samples. Um, and I just want to show you the difference for H parallel to C. So here's data, early data from, from Yuji and Takaka that shows for ion selenium, pure ion selenium, that if you put a field parallel to C, you induce enormous magneto resistance, and then it becomes very difficult, in fact, to extract the intrinsic effective normal state resistivity. And here's the ion selenium 35 Tesla data, where you see you've not really introduced uh, any strong additional temperature dependence. But you can still get right down to the lowest temperatures in a 35 Tesla field. Okay, so the bottom line is uh, this is what we saw. Um, so here is essentially the, the doping uh, where uh, the putative pneumatic quantum critical point uh, exists. And what's nice here is that actually once you get to 16% and above, there is no magneto resistance above TC, either in, say, 25% here or 16%. And so really uh, you, you can have sort of uh, good... Uh, confidence that the, uh, the resistivity measured at 35 Tesla uh, is that of the intrinsic resistivity in the absence of superconductivity. And you see a distinct change here from T linear, which we got measured down to about 1.5 Kelvin. Just below 1.5 Kelvin, we, we're hitting superconducting fluctuations. So HC2 is of, of the order of 36 Tesla uh, at this doping range. So you start to see a small downturn here, which we've just removed from the data. But clearly, it's different from what's seen at 25%, where you have a quadratic temperature dependence of the resistivity. And I will show you now, zooming in, and this region for pure iron selenium is also where you recover a T squared. Yes? The curves at x equal to 0 at 35 Tesla and 0 Tesla are offset, but yes. in the other samples, they don't. No, no. So there is, as I said, there is a small magnet positive magnet resistance actually for all x less than 16%, which vanishes uh, at 16% and above. So yeah. Okay, so here is the um, pure iron selenium, uh, and I'm just plotting here the derivative. In fact, for the very lowest temperature points, we have had to take. Uh, field sweeps and just show the 35 Tesla data. But what you clearly see here is that, that again, as in the iron uh, bearing 1, 2, 2, that the derivative appears to be going linearly down to zero, suggesting uh, that the low temperature temperature dependence is, is, is T squared, even though if I go back, you know, there was a large region where it was effectively T linear uh, above, uh, above, the, uh, above TC. Um, and so yeah, here plotting against T squared, you can see the range of, over which th that is obeyed. And from the slope, uh, we get a slope of around 260 nano-ohm centimeters per Kelvin. And we can estimate, we have the, a formula uh, for the, the coefficient, which we can just plant, plotting in uh, known uh, Fermi surface parameters for the system, uh, you can get a range between 90 and 230, which is in good agreement with the uh, measured value. Okay, so here is the whole set of samples. Um, so I think you can see that there is this uh, T squared behavior, lowest temperatures. Here again, there's a slight downturn for the resistivity at 13%, crossing over to T linear, and then back to T squared. And here you can really see uh, how there's no magneto resistance for the higher dope samples, but there's always some finite magneto resistance for the small. Uh, and taking the derivatives, uh, you can see there's a clear delineation in the transport behavior. So these are all, what, if you like, low-dope systems show very similar behavior, and this dropping off of the derivative as you uh, reach the T-squared regime. At 16%, the derivative is now just flat, up to about 15 Kelvin, so over a decade in temperature, and then crosses over again immediately to becoming T-squared, which becomes... Uh, flat again, suggesting you're returning to a T-linear resistivity. So all of this shows a very systematic uh, variation with, with doping. And if you take the slopes, um, which I plot here in these black triangles, the slopes grow gradually. So this is the strength of the T-squared coefficient, uh, but not dramatically uh, as you approach 16%, but then drop very dramatically once the, the pneumatic state is lost. 
And this was sort of reflected uh, the trend seen in the, say, the strength of the superconducting uh, gap. TC itself doesn't change very much across this regime, but the gap itself drops from very uh, sharply beyond 16%. And so this suggests it may be a correlation between the superconductivity and mass enhancement as, as manifest in, in the coefficient of the T-squared resistivity. But uh, this is not the whole story because what has been shown uh, in, in this isolinium, although it's isovalent substitution, uh, quantum oscillation measurements by uh, Amalia Caldea's group show that actually both the electron and the hole pockets grow uh, in magnitude as you uh, dope. And of course, you know, the A coefficient is dependent on the carrier density. So if the carrier density is growing, then this will influence the, the A. So in fact, if M star stays the same, your A coefficient would just drop away. What it's actually doing is growing with, with doping. And we can, by taking the frequencies observed uh, by Amalia, uh, we can then uh, look, uh, sort of take out the, the, the growth in the carrier density and just look, focus on the part which we believe is, is due to the effective mass. Okay, so that's what we did here. So this is now a kind of a renormalized A coefficient where we've taken out this, this change in the carrier density. And you see that there's, there's a much more of an increase here as we approach 16%, but still the drop off uh, perhaps is less dramatic now because obviously there you have more carriers in the, in the uh, higher dose samples. The range of the T squared resistivity again shows this characteristic uh, shape. Um, and here I'm showing that they, where your onset of T-linear resistivity comes in. And stress again that for the 16% T-linear resistivity extends over this uh, whole regime. Okay, so, um, so this was for us uh, initially quite a surprise because you know, if this system is only... Um, if, if quasi-particles are coupling to, say, pneumatic fluctuations, quantum critical fluctuations, you typically think in terms of Pomerantiuk instability that these will be Q equals zero type fluctuations. Um, and that, therefore, they may not uh, necessarily manifest themselves in the transport properties where you need you know, large angle scattering to, to decay the, or relax the momentum. Um, and indeed, there have been theories um, by several members of the audience about uh, how um, you might get T-linear resistivity in a pneumatic system, but it, it's, quite, it's quite challenging to get there. In fact, you, it's very difficult in a clean system. You can, you can get T-linear resistivity in a pneumatic, at a pneumatic quantum critical point in a disordered system where really the, the change in the resistivity is small compared to, the, say, the residual resistivity. Um, but here we're seeing, um, you know, quite uh, striking uh, variation in the, in the T-linear part of the resistivity. Of course, there is a residual resistivity here, but I think the whole evolution, even for very pure Einsteinium, you see the very much reduced residual resistivity here, suggests that disorder is not the, the driving force for, for the physics that we're seeing. Um, and so, you know, one idea that, that uh, came to us uh, in discussions with, with Chi Mao is, of course, that, that there, there are theories that suggest that the pneumatic state in, in ion selenium uh, is not just the simple Pomeranchuk type, that there is also uh, so-called um, anti-ferroquadrupolar interactions, which, which are, uh, let's say, coincident with these anti-ferromagnetic fluctuations in the system. And this is something which can coexist uh, both in uh, the chalcogenides and in the predictide systems, but depending on the system, one may dominate over the other. And certainly here, the idea or the argument of Chi Mao and, and, and his collaborator Yu is that if the, the strong coupling between these uh, fluctuations and, and the itinerant quasi-particles, this may suppress the magnetism but, but promote this type of pneumatic. And this gives you a finite Q uh, scattering that potentially gives us the, the resistivity that we see. There are other... Uh, proposals for possible finite Q. Um, but we cannot forget the magnetism. I mean, there is magnetism there. We know that if you add pressure to the system, um, very quickly you, you generate a spin density wave, and, and there have been MUSR and NMR suggestions that below TS there are significant magnetic fluctuations. So maybe that is what we, we, we are coupling to. 
And you know, the, the evolution of the phase diagram here is very similar to that seen in the panictides. Um, but there is one set of uh, data that I think uh, would argue against this, and, and this is the uh, very beautiful uh, series of measurements done by uh, Yuji's group and Taka, who uh, studied with transport the evolution of the, the different phases, both as a function of X in the ion selenium sulfur system and pressure. And although there is this low-lying spin density wave state near ion selenium, pure ion selenium, as you dope and you see how this pneumatic is being suppressed down to the quantum critical point, at the same point, the spin density wave phase is pushed to higher and higher pressures. So really, while there's magnetism there, we don't see any evidence from this picture that it's the magnetic fluctuations that are going quantum critical at 16%. Really, you would argue that it is indeed the pneumatic fluctuations that are responsible for this behavior. Okay, um, so in, in a sort of preparation for the next talk, though, we were also interested to notice that in all these systems, as I said at the beginning, there is a T-linear resistivity. And we know a lot about the Fermi surface, the Fermi surface parameters of this system. So we thought, well, we can perhaps uh, estimate the, the strength of scattering in the T-linear regime and compare it to this very nice plot that was mentioned earlier on. Uh, by Andy McKenzie's group that suggested for a lot of co correlated systems, particularly those uh, near quantum criticality, uh, that you have a, say, a range between one and two, uh, which is a multiple of KBT, this so-called Planckian limit that, um, that Sean uh, alluded to earlier. And again, we can uh, determine this alpha coefficient from of, from, from both the, the strength of the resistivity coefficient and the same parameters that we used in extracting our A star coefficients. And here I show basically the, the, the value of alpha within the red zone, so within the T-linear regime. And in fact, it's, it's very strongly pinned uh, around one, uh, right up to 16%. And possibly e the, even these small departures from that we may think about as due to the appearance of a third pocket, which changes. Here we've assumed the presence of two pockets all the way through, but there may well be uh, the emergence of a third pocket uh, at higher sulfur dopings. But in any case, uh, within our experimental resolution, we can see that alpha is, be again, between one and two. So it does seem that within the quantum critical fan, there is a kind of universal value for this, as far as you can tell by this sort of Druder-like analysis. Okay, so in the last five minutes or so, I just wanted to put this into the context of a system that's still very dear to me, the whole dope cuprates, in particular this strange metal phase in the overdope regime. Now, when you look at the phase diagram of the cuprates, of course, uh, the first thing that strikes you is there are a lot of potential quantum critical points um, and then you think, well, where do I start? Um, but uh, I think the, the one that universally people are, are most interested in is the so-called P-star critical point, which marks the end of the pseudo-gap line, or where the pseudo-gap, this loss of uh, states at the Fermi level, uh, closes um, at, at around 19, 20% in the whole doped uh, cuprate phase diagram. Um, and we know from many spectroscopic and transport properties that there is a very profound change in the fermiology of the system. You start out in this regime, at least, say, close to the edge of the superconducting dome, with a large hole-like Fermi surface, continuous Fermi surface that also displays quantum oscillations. But then as you go inside the pseudogap regime, this is truncated into these disconnected Fermi arcs, as they're called, um, where you now, uh, you, you, and, and it's not clear even if, if you know, these, these states seem to be lost down to the lowest temperature, and perhaps you know, it's not clear even above T star whether those states actually recover. So is, is this a, you know, really a, a system which has a genuine transition in, in P, but not necessarily a, a transition in T? Uh, is, is a, is a long-standing debate in the field. However, it's very clear that there are broken symmetries inside the pseudo-gap regime. In fact, uh, there are many uh, beautiful experiments suggesting that this T-star line uh, is associated with some 
type of broken symmetry. But again, my question is, you know, what, do, do any of these uh, broken symmetries manifest themselves in, in an evolution of the transport properties in the same way that we understand in, let's say, a more conventional quantum critical uh, po point of view? And if they did, that might help us to identify which of these is, is really responsible for the pseudo gap. Um, but you know, almost a decade ago, we did a similar measurement to the ones we've, I've just shown you for pernictides and chalcogenides in, in lanthanum strontium copper oxide. And really to our surprise, what we saw was that for, this is optimal doped LSCO and this is non-superconducting LSCO. And in the non-superconducting LSCO, you clearly see a T squared resistivity. At optimal doping, uh, it's the T linear. But in fact, the dominant form of the resistivity right across this regime is, is T linear. So rather than there being a singular point at which you see T linear resistivity, you get this sort of quantum critical phase uh, extending in the, in the zero temperature limit. And, and that is very hard for us to understand within a simple uh, quantum critical picture. Um, indeed, the, the strength of this T linear term grows essentially from zero of course, we know it's T squared out here, and reaches some kind of maximum uh, very close to uh, this 19% doping where the pseudo gap opens. Um, there was also the T squared term that we could d d delineate, say, from the derivative of the residuity, which doesn't seem to do anything, in contrast to what's seen in pernictides and also now in, in chalcogenides of this huge enhancement as you approach uh, P star. So, um, so just sort of to end with a bit of speculation, um, again, we can estimate what this alpha is, um, and we find that actually when it reaches the P star, uh, the value is, is, is at or close to this value seen in, in other materials. But we'd argue that as you go below P star, of, of course here we expect we still have a full Fermi surface, then you start seeing Fermi arcs, and of course that brings down the, the carrier density again. So you would expect perhaps that this would, uh, would change dramatically here, but it, it somehow it, it, just seems to, it just seems to flatten out. And so our speculation is maybe, uh, you know, could the fact that you reach this limit at uh, P star uh, be actually the thing that's responsible for the opening of a pseudo gap? So not necessarily some kind of broken symmetry, um, you know, some typical quantum critical uh, type uh, scenario, but actually that you reach this bound uh, and this drives you into a, in a completely different state where you lose uh, effectively quasi-particles at low, uh, low temperatures. Um, and, you know, um, Sean mentioned this uh, earlier in his talk, you know, that we, we, we know that, that there are two uh, defining behaviors at high temperature in terms of uh, whether material, whether its resistivity saturates, approaches the so-called Motjoff-Regel limit, or whether it just crashes through it. And uh, we see that, you know, you might think, well, is this just some kind of extension of some anomalous scattering? And I think Sean also mentioned this, that no, there is a clear uh, evidence from optical connectivity that as you cross this uh, rho max, you get a transfer of spectral weight, low energy spectral weight to high energies. Um, there are many ways to explain this. One uh, that was one of the first really was uh, within DMFT, where they showed how the spectral function for a correlated system near the MOT transition uh, varies very dramatically with temperature. So here you have your quasi-particle pole at low temperatures, but as you increase temperature, you see how that gets suppressed and the spectral weight goes to the lower and upper Hubbard bands. And this, therefore, there's no longer a scattering rate that you can associate uh, with the drop in the conductivity or the rise in the resistivity. And it may well be then that uh, as Sean uh, did uh, spec postulate uh, that there are two limits uh, to uh, one set by the absolute magnitude of the resistivity in which you lose quasi-particle states, but also possibly when you reach this Planckian limit and maybe in all the quantum critical systems that we know about inside the quantum critical fan, this is the, this is the limit, this is the bound but it might well be that cuprates are the only material to cross both of these bounds, and it's by crossing that bound that the pseudo gap itself uh, emerges. 
Okay, and with that, uh, I'll just advertise um, a, a, a review that we've just published on some of these aspects um, and put up my conclusions. Thank you for your attention.